Hello, my another guest today is Professor Stephen Harnett from Université du Québec à Montréal and the University of Southampton. Professor Harnett is a cognitive scientist. His research is on categorization, communication and cognition as well as in open research. He's one of the pioneers of the open access movement and its devoted advocate. Among his many achievements in the field of open science, there is a creation of a GNU ePrints, uh, the first software for creating uh, institutional repositories compliant with the Open Archives Initiative model and participation in Budapest Open Access Initiative in 2001. Professor Harnett, welcome and thank you for, for accepting our invitation. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, I would like to begin our conversation with a question uh, regarding one of recent articles written by Heather Joseph from Spark. Uh, in her paper she named four key pieces of infrastructure that in her opinion allow checking the successful implementation of open access movement. And the first one she, she mentions is the establishment of a robust set of open access journal, while the second, establishment of open access repositories. Would you agree with this point of view? Uh, I wouldn't agree with the order. And you mentioned the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which was in 2001. There, too, these two components were mentioned, but in the opposite order. First, open access uh, archives, repositories, and second, open access, what, it wasn't yet called open access journals, but open access journals. And there's a reason why the order should be that, and not the other way around. Could you please uh, explain it? I'll be happy to explain it. First of all, open access means free online access. It doesn't mean free online access journals. It means free online access to journal articles. So the, one of the reasons, uh, this is a, a, a less fundamental reason, one of the reasons not to put open access journals first is because it gives people the impression that open access means open access journals. It doesn't mean open access journals. Open access journals are one of the two ways to provide open access to journal articles. It's about journal articles. And not only did Budapest Open Access Initiative put repositories first, I'll explain repositories in a moment, but um, since then, in order to distinguish them more, we even gave them colors to distinguish them. Um, open access journals are, are what's called gold open access. Not because gold is better than something mm -hmm. else, but just because the original directory of open access journals uh, was colored gold otherwise. The repositories <coughs> are self-archiving in repositories is called green open access. So there's gold and green open access, and my, the main content of my discussion will be why it's so important that green should come first. Um, I'll give it to you in a, in a, in a, in a nutshell. I gave you the first reason. <coughs> most journals are not, <coughs> excuse me, most journals are not open access journals. Most journals are still subscription journals. So if open access just meant open access journals, then we'd have very little open access and it would take a very, very long time before everything would be open access because we'd have to wait until either the subscription journals convert to open access gold or uh, are replaced by rival journals that are gold open access. And that's gonna, that depends on publishers and it'll take, it, I don't think it'll ever happen, but it would take a very long time. Green open access <coughs> is taking the articles that are in the journals that already exist and the author takes the final peer-reviewed accepted draft, f final version, the author's version, and puts it in an institutional repository. An institutional repository, as you said, is a, um, uh, it's created by a software, which we, were, we created the first software, ePrints, but since then, DSpace, my, my graduate student who created ePrints was stolen by MIT and then he created a clone called DSpace. It doesn't matter which one is used. They we're not in the business. It's not a business. But both of these repositories, both of these softwares create a, for free create a repository in which authors can put their articles and the repositories are all interoperable, which means they can be harvested. They all use the, uh, roughly the same uh, tagging format. So it's as if you deposited not just in your own institutional repository, but into one big global repository, because it can be all be harvested together. 
So <clears throat> Green Open Access is putting the final author's draft into the uh, institutional repository. And the reason it has to come first is not just what I just told you, which is that most journals are still not subscription journals. So if we're waiting for gold, we're going to be waiting for a long time or maybe forever. But also because, um, because uh, these repositories are today able to make all journal articles accessible to everybody. Gold open access journals will only do it when they convert. The repositories can do it for all articles. Now, to anticipate your question, the usual worry or the usual objection to green open access, not, it's not an objection, but it's a limit, they think it's a limitation, is that publishers have these embargoes which say, I'm a subscription publisher, I'm not a gold open access publisher, or maybe I'm a hybrid uh, gold and subscription publisher. Either you pay me for gold, or you're not allowed to make it green for uh, six months, 12 months, 24 months, forever. These embargoes, which block green, people have thought were a fundamental limitation on green open access, but they're not, for two reasons. I haven't given you a chance to ask any questions, but I'm answering them all already. One of the reasons that they're not a limitation is that intelligent, normal, researchers who are in the minority ignore publishers and simply put their, their, uh, their final drafts up on the web. Uh, uh, physicists have been doing this since 1990, before open access even, and come computer scientists have been doing it earlier even, in the 1980s. They don't come to beg their publishers to allow them to put their final drafts on. They put it on and, and nothing, and there are no consequences. They don't, uh, the publishers don't try to uh, super, sue their own authors. And uh, so the intelligent, normal <clears throat> researchers just deposit and ignore the embargoes. But for the timid, less intelligent uh, researchers, there's a solution, which is that the repository software, which I told you about, also has a button called the, I call it the almost open access button. You can also call it the ePrint request button. If you put an article, uh, into the repository, and you don't make it open access, you make it closed, closed access, so only the title and the author and the, and the, and the abstract uh, and the journal, etc., is visible, not the whole text. You can't get the whole text. Then there's a button, and a user simply has to press the button, which sends an automatic email message to the author saying, I want one copy for research purposes of this article, and the email that, that the author receives has a button, the author just has to click once and it sends it automatically. So that's not open access, it's almost open access, but for the 60% of journals don't embargo open access, so with green open access you can have immediate open access for 60% of articles, and for the 40% that is embargoed, and for the sub subset of the 40% that is embargoed that has less intelligent, more timid authors, you can use the button instead. But I would like to ask you a question about uh, the way how to guarantee the, uh, uh, the reviewing, the high standard reviewing. Tell me why the... you ask me this question. I'm very curious. It, it, it's, it's a complete non sequitur and I'm curious why you ask it. Uh, what have I said that implies that reviewing is, is any different with what I described? That... I said green open access is taking the final peer-reviewed, accepted draft of the author and putting it free for all on the web. Peer review is already finished. The but article is accepted. What about the preprints? What? Uh, what about the preprints? You know, for uh, I'm not talking about preprints. I'm not talking about unrefereed uh, uh, drafts. I'm but talking about refereed, peer-reviewed, accepted final drafts. That's green open access. How does uh, it? So, could you please, for many people from the publishing business, claim, and that's one of their, I think, strongest arguments, that, that you know, gold open access is the right way to achieve the peer review. Why is it the right way to pre achieve the achieve for peer review? The right way to achieve peer review is peer review. And subscription journals do peer review. So if I subscribe, uh, su submit an article to a subscription journal and it's, and it's peer reviewed and I revise it and the final version is accepted, that is a peer reviewed article. 
And it's a subscription journal, not a gold open access journal. So you don't need gold open access in order to have peer review. On the contrary, gold open access is new, peer review is old. Subscription journals have been doing it for 60, 100, maybe more years. Okay, so I would like to uh, ask you about the, who's the major beneficiary of, of open science. Uh, you, in 1995, wrote a paper that mentioned the, uh, the named the, the, the scientists, the esoteric minority, and uh, are they the, 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 the beneficiaries of the open science? Or okay, several things to tell you. Uh, I'm talking about open access, not open science. We'll talk about the difference between open science and open access in a moment. But do you want to ask me that same question about open access? Or do you want to really ask about open science, in which case we have to talk about many other things because open access is not the same as open science. Okay, so may maybe about uh, open access. Yeah. Okay, then I can answer it very simply. Uh, <clears throat> Heather Joseph, the one who wrote that article and who has been extremely effective in the United States, in, 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 she's really amazing. Um, one of her very successful um, strategies is the following, it's, it's a, you can say it as a slogan, public access to publicly funded research. And so Heather would tell you the primary beneficiary of open access is the public. And she's right. But, but, the way the public benefits from open access is not from the capacity to read these articles. Every year, um, about um, two and a half million articles are published in maybe 28,000 peer-reviewed journals in all disciplines. And we're not just talking about science, we're talking also about social science and humanities, philosophy, etc. 28,000 peer-reviewed journals in, in um, dozens and dozens of disciplines. The benefit to the public of open access is not that now they can read all these articles. These articles are not written in general for the general public. They're welcome to read it, and with open access they will be able to read it, but the primary benefit for the public is not that they can read these articles, but that the intended users of these articles, which is other researchers, peers in every field, can then access this, this research, um, use it, apply it, to the benefit of the general public. So if science, and I'll speak now about science in particular, but it's also true of humanities and social science, if science is beneficial to the public, if it's worth for the public to pay money to fund science, then it's worth that the science that comes out of it should be accessible to all of its users. And the users are not the general public, but scientists. They're the ones who who, uh, who build on the research and they're the ones who apply it and make the, the, uh, the uh, products that eventually, um, and, and medicines and, and, and engineering that eventually uh, benefit the, the public as well. So yes, the, the primary beneficiary of open access is the general public, but the way they become a beneficiary is by making the researchers able to access uh, all the work and not just the work that their institutions can afford to subscribe to which is just a small fraction. Oh, and the other side of it is, of course, the researchers who do the research, not the ones who access it, but the ones who do the, actually um, publish the research, benefit because a researcher's career, a researcher's salary, a researcher's funding depend on the impact of their work. If somebody does research and, and no researcher finds it interesting, nobody reads it, nobody cites it, nobody builds on it, then it may as well not have been done. So a researcher's career depends on being used and cited, and open access maximizes that as well. So everybody benefits, the, the users, the, the producers of the research, and the general public. Uh, advocates of open access uh, seem to perceive it as an inherent part of knowledge distribution, dissemination, uh, which is the core of scientific praxis. And some others think that the heart of scientific process are open data. I think Jeffrey Bolton, professor of geology at the University of Edinburgh, uh, said something like that. But there are also those who claim that we are witnessing some sort of big, new, big shift in knowledge uh, distribution after letter writing system and peer reviewed journal system, and that's new scholarly communication system harnessing the new technology of the web to improve this dissemination of, of knowledge. 
Uh, do you personally find these views mutually exclusive or do you think they are complementary? I think they're non sequiturs. In other words, they're, 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 there's very little connection between them. And, and now we do have to talk about open science because I've only been talking about open access and the, all of these revolutions are not part of open access, although they will follow from it. <clears throat> open access is about open access to journal articles, peer-reviewed journal articles. Open data is the, by data we mean the, the research data on which these articles are based. Again, it's obvious that access to the journal articles has to come first because it's in vain that you make all of your data available to ever, ever accessible to everybody if the article that describes the research, etc., is not accessible. So open access to articles has to come before open access to data, or at least in parallel with it. And open access to data doesn't face the obstacle that open access to, uh, to uh, open data does not face the same uh, obstacle that uh, open access faces. Open access has publishers barring access. That's what uh, the opposite of open access is toll access, toll like in a no. toll, and that's subscriptions and licenses and, and pay per view. There's no such thing for data. Publishers don't own the data of, of um, uh, researchers. There is a small problem with data, which is uh, when you uh, publish an article, once you're ready and it's peer-reviewed and you publish an article, you want everybody to read it and have access to it immediately. And you don't want any money for it. That's articles. With data, that's not always true. I mean, uh, scientists, and we're now talking about science more than anything, are not, their profession is not data gathering. That, if they, they, that's not what they tell their children, what does daddy do? I gather data. They do gather data but they want to be able to analyze and interpret the data that they gather. That's why they gather it. So there is a little bit of resistance in some fields for a while to making their data open right away. Eventually, yes, when I've, when I've exploited it and mined it, um, then, then others can, can do it too. But why should I even gather it? I mean, if, if, I, if I have to make my data open immediately after I've gathered it, then let somebody else gather it, and then I'll do the analysis of his data, right? So there is a little bit of resistance to open data, but it's not the same as the publisher's objections to, um, or the embargoes on open access. Now, this brave new world of open science where everything will be different, et cetera, et cetera, I've been hearing this now for increasingly loudly for 20 years, and I have to say that all of these things are predicated on the fact that we have open access and we don't have open access. So everybody is running. It's, there must be a Polish expression for this when you're, when you're, when you're um, overreaching for something or you reach beyond where the thing is and you don't get anything. We're overreaching for revolutionary, glamorous, open science with all kinds of new things, some of them real and some of them just fantasy. But the, but the basic prerequisite for it, which is open access, we don't have. And just as it's, a, it's, it's harming open access to make everybody consider open access to be gold open access, because then they're reaching for a new form of publishing and they forget that open access is not about a new form of publishing, it's about access. In the same way, if you run for, reach for open science, open knowledge, open everything, without even opening up access in the first place, then all you're doing is going into a fantasy. And a fantasy that gets in the way of open access. And I'll tell you right away that, that uh, you'll have this at this conference that we have over here. Um, for example, Cameron Nalen and I don't agree on this at all. I could, we agree absolutely on the end game. We all want uh, all articles, all data to be open, reusable, uh, CC, CC by, etc. We all want that, but we have to get there. And the, the uh, people who, ha who, uh, who uh, get ahead of, uh, ahead of themselves are already in the ideal world of, of everything is accessible to everybody and they're forgetting that no, in fact, uh, most of it is locked up still. And if they insist on more now, for example, I mentioned the obstacle of the authors who don't want to open it up right away. And the publishers who put embargoes, they put embargoes on open access, but if you say, I don't just want open, oh, by the way, you need another terminology between, besides green open access and gold open access. I'll repeat, gold open access is open access journals, which, uh, and green open access is subscription journals, but the author makes the article open access in a repository. Well, there's also gratis open access and libre open access. So far, I've been talking about gratis open access. Gratis open access just means free, freely accessible online, and with that 
free online access. You have the you have the possibility of reading it on the screen, printing it out, storing it, uh, d um, data crunching it locally. But that's it. Libre open access says you can reuse it, make derivative works, remix it, etc., etc. In science, of course, you can do that with the ideas, but you can't do it with the text. You're not allowed to take my text and, and reuse it, remix it, etc. And it's not even clear that you need to. You do need to be able to do that for, for, for data mining text. And Cameron is very much, and I am too, uh, looking forward to the day when we can data mine all of the open access articles. But we don't have open access articles. We just have a few gold open access journals and a few authors that are willing to make their articles open access. So we first have to get them gratis open access, gratis green open access, and then we can move on to the rest. If we move to the rest, we get nothing or next to nothing. In actual fact, you have uh, just answered Answer. my next question, for I wanted to, <coughs> to ask you about what you think about the, what Cameron Nalen said in one of his I papers. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. His objectives are my objectives. We all want Libre open access, and in the end I also want gold open access. But I want, by the way, I have another distinction to say. There's fool's gold and there's fair gold. And what we have now is fool's gold open access. I also want gold open access, but fair, fair gold open access. And I also want Libre open access, where everything can be reused, data, text, etc., remind, um, text mined, etc. But for that, we first have to get vanilla, you know, ordinary open access. And if we if we ask for more, we'll get nothing. There's another saying in English: Don't let the best get in the way of the better. Yeah. Uh, but, so you think that uh, libre open access is a natural consequence? It will come, uh, for sure. Gold will come, fair gold will come, libre open access will come, open data will come, open access books will come too, but we can't push for them now. Uh, according to many people, uh, data sharing seems a necessary step to, towards maximizing the, the, the use of, of research results. And, and Jeffrey Bolton, I, I mentioned before, says that nowadays the amount of data is so vast that no one can believe it could be analyzed effectively without being openly shared uh, worldwide. While Michael Nielsen, the author of the Reinventing and the Discovery, uh, writes about <coughs> citizen science, some sort of outsourcing, uh, employing regular people to, to, to help analyze these huge amounts of data. What's, what's your opinion about it? Do you think it's some sort of science fiction? Okay, but no, it's not science fiction, but let's, let's remember the distinction between articles and data. You've gone back to data, okay? And the only objection, the only um, uh, um, obstacle for open data is if an author doesn't want to make his data open, and if the article on which the, the, uh, the, uh, that is based on the data is not open access. So these are two separate things. You can have all, you can do whatever citizen science you want to do with open data if you have open access first. But if you don't have open access, this is all just fantasy. So it's just the next step of the... It's the next step and we have to take the first step. There's no point having a conference about the next step when we still haven't taken the first step. And there are reasons why we haven't taken the first step. My focus during this conference will be on how to get the first step to finally happen. It's been 20 years waiting for it to happen. And here we are talking about open science revolutions, uh, citizen science, etc. And the first step, which you have to take, otherwise you can't have any of the rest of it, hasn't been taken. Okay. <laughs> so what would be your general assessment? Of what? Of open access movement after... I think 12 years. I think it's been too, no, it's 20 years. I, I think it's been too long already. And it's time to get serious. And no more, you know, uh, fantasies, etc. It's a, the solution is policies by, consider that the, the producers of all of the material of which we're talking about open access, both the data and the articles, are universities, research institutions. And it's funded by research funders. So the, so the, the key players are universities, research institutions, and research funders. They have to mandate gratis green open access. Once they all, globally, it's no use if, if uh, Netherlands does it or Poland does it, once all universities and all research funders all over the planet have made it a requirement, 
as a condition of receiving funding for research and as a condition for being evaluated for your research performance, because uh, at universities you're supposed to be doing research, if a precondition for that will be you have to make it gratis, green, open access, then we'll be able to go to the next step. Until we do that, there's no point talking about the next step. Okay. Professor Hanat, thank you very much. Pleasure. It was a great pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure to talk. Thank you.